I'm Sonia Morton Firth, and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today, my guest is Theo Fleury, NHL player, Olympic gold medalist, Stanley Cup champion, best selling author, and speaker. As a young teenager, Theo was raped 150 times by his hockey coach and turned to drugs and alcohol to overcome the pain and suffering. One day it came to the point where he found himself with a gun in his mouth. Today, Theo defines himself as a victor over trauma and a facilitator for those trying to find their way. Watch this interview as we go deep into trauma, epigenetics, the causes, and some of the tools to help with the repercussions on our mental health. Theo, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. And I'd just like to tell the audience, I feel so honored uh, to have Theo here today. I'm sitting in London and Theo, where are you? I'm in Calgary, Canada. Calgary, Canada. Now, I'm guessing it's quite cold over there, the same as, as it is here in London. Yeah, we have two feet of snow, and uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's actually pretty mild today, so it's not, not too bad, so, but it's, it's cold. <laughs> it's cold, it's cold. Well, look, I've got so much that I'd love to talk to you about, um, but before you start, we start, um, and I'm, I, I know you've told your story, probably uh, you probably count thousands of times mm -hmm. but I'd be very honored and grateful if you could share your story with with myself and sure. the audience I think yeah. that would be a, a great starting point for sure um so uh I have a significant uh trauma history in my background so <clears throat> both my parents uh, experienced childhood trauma in their life and that manifested itself, uh, in addictions. And so, uh, my dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a prescription pill addict. And so I grew up in this, you know, crazy home, um, <clears throat> where, you know, I saw a lot of chaos. I saw a lot of violence. I saw, you know, just my parents' traumas, fighting with each other constantly every did you feel that was um did you feel that was unusual did you did you know anything? no i no we I, we didn't know any different right yeah. and uh and so being you know the oldest in my family or the king baby so to speak you know uh you know, there's a lot of nights as a five, six, seven, eight year old kid where I have my referee jersey on standing in the middle of my parents, keeping them from, you know, saying horrible things to each other, hurting each other, you know, all these things. And so that was my, uh, you know, that's what I grew up in. I grew up in a lot of chaos. And, uh, and so around five years old, uh, I discovered this wonderful sport called ice hockey and I can tell you from the very first time I stepped on the ice like it was magic and it was heaven and it was like everything that I wasn't getting at home all I had to do was step in an arena and I got love and I had teammates and I had friends and I had people that you know looked after me and instilled these incredible morals you know, that I hold very near and dear to my heart today. And I think it's a big reason why I was able to survive um, was you it know, for as long as it was. you as well, escaping? Oh, yeah. It was like I didn't have to think about anything when I was, you know, uh, on the ice. And so, um, from the time I was six years old until, you know, uh, until I made it, <clears throat> You know, uh, I, I would tell everybody, I'm going to play in the NHL someday, you know, and how many six-year-olds do you know that are that focused yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that driven, you know, that at six years old, you actually have a plan inside of your head that, you and, know, and did you, I mean, could you visualize it if you were? Oh yeah, I was, I was already there. Visualize it. Yeah, I was already there. And so, you know, I spent the majority of my childhood in, in arenas. And, uh, um, and it was, uh, like I said, it was, it was my happy place. And you know what? I was like really good at, 
you know, what I was doing. And uh, so as I climbed up the ladder, um, you know, people uh, in, in the professional hockey world started to watch me and started to follow me. And so when I was 15 years old, uh, I moved away from home to pursue my did career. You have, did you have people looking after you? I mean, 15 is very young. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the guy that recruited me, um, you know, looked after me. But what happened was the guy that recruited me, he ended up raping me 150 times over the next two and a half years. And but, so I get this right. This was your, your coach, the guy that, that yeah. Was yeah. So the guy that recruited me knew that I had come from a really messed up home and, you know, I was enthusiastic. I was, you know, I was driven, focused, and, you know, he basically promised me a one-way ticket to the NHL if I followed him. And, uh, you know, needless that decision and that choice, you know, obviously changed me for the rest of my life. And, and uh, you know, I was left with a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. And there wasn't one person in the world I could have told because I knew that if I told, first of all, I wouldn't be believed. And then secondly, I knew that would be the end of my hockey career. Did you ever feel like just running away or escaping or trying to get away from this guy? Well, it wasn't too long after this whole, uh, you know, like I was being raped three times a week. How, how does you even, how did you cope with that? I mean, I, I, look, I, I can't even imagine, and I'm not right. going to sit here and say I can imagine, mm. I can't imagine. Um, how do you cope with that on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, this isn't just a one-off. He's consistently right. doing it for, for years. Well, I, I think at the beginning, I cart, um, compartmentalized it, mm -hmm. right? You know, and I never lost sight of what I was actually trying to accomplish, right? And so uh, my, focused, my focus mostly was, you know, on continuing my journey to get to professional hockey in some way, shape, or form. And uh, um, so the hockey was sort of your savior, but also the reason you were in this. Situation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so it wasn't too long after that I discovered alcohol as a coping mechanism, right? And uh, from the very first sip, like I was hooked, hooked instantly. And, uh, and so I went on to have this, uh, you know, amazing professional life, you know, like amazing, uh, everything that I dreamed up in my head, I accomplished, you know, Stanley cup, Olympic gold medal. I won a world junior championship. I played in seven all-star games, you know, a thousand points, uh, you know, like every, every kid's dream in Canada, like. I lived it times a hundred. Right. But, <laughs> you know, when I wasn't at the rink, you know, that's when it got really crazy. Right. You know, and the, you know, because the thing about addiction is it never gets better. Right. It just gets worse and worse and worse. I mean, just, just on that, I mean, the addiction and, and it's a funny word addiction, isn't it? Because, we, we, yes. you know, people, it, it's, it, it, it's surrounded by shame itself. Oh, the, huge, um, hugely. Um, was it, and, and, and it's, it's, it's weird, but it was this, this wasn't an addiction, this was a way of you coping, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I hate the word addiction like you do because, uh, because it has a lot of shame attached to it. So I changed it. I call it emotional pain management. That's what addiction is. Which it is, but, but yeah. I get that, right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. And so, um, in 2003, after having this amazing hockey career, uh, I got kicked out of the NHL because I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop doing drugs and my behavior was like 
completely out of control. I mean, how, what are we talking about at this time? Were you, were you on cocaine, presumably? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You name it, I did it. Uh, right? were, you, were you still sort of functioning or were you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pretty well functioning at this point. Yep. I functioned right till probably the last couple of years of my career. And that's when my, that's when my mental illness kicked in like hard, huge. Right. So, uh, you know, I suffer from severe depression, uh, anxiety, panic, uh, attacks and around the end of my career, you know, those were really, really significant, uh, in my life. And so, you know, I went on the, <laughs> I went on the big pharma tour for a while, you know? So this is the, like, so basically doctors prescribing you yeah. meds. Yeah. Did they yeah. not, I mean, before prescribing meds and, um, you know, I think everyone's got their views on meds. I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan at all because I'm, I'm not a fan really at all. Other ways of treating, you know, I've interviewed a lot of guests that have had um, mental health issues and, you know, the majority of them say there's other there's other ways that yeah absolutely and, yeah. and yet the medical profession are so quick to to, to put drugs down your throat well, oh it's type of drug. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable it is unbelievable so i went on that tour for a while <clears throat> and then uh 16 years ago i had a fully loaded pistol in my mouth ready to pull the trigger and end my life not because I wanted, not because I wanted to die, but I was completely exhausted from living in emotional pain and suffering. If we, I, if I take you back to that, I mean, do you remember that point that? Oh yeah. Where you were and that that night. Yep, I was in the desert. You were in the I was, desert. I was living in uh, a place called Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I had gone there uh, to a trauma treatment facility. Uh, a few years before that and uh, absolutely fell in love with the place and uh, I bought a house there um, there was great recovery there there was lots of people um, that I met who were in recovery that were doing you know they were doing the deal and uh, you know and then <clears throat> that one last um, sort of uh, well when I left after I left the game you know like I went, I went on the bender of all benders, I'll tell you. And, uh, you know, I, I'd met this, this, uh, cocaine dealer from Columbia. Just a area type there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so he would, every time his, the shipment would come in, he would, I would be the first guy he called. And so I would drive 45 minutes <clears throat> to Albuquerque and, uh, you know, I would get it like the purest, the purest it would ever be. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, here I am, I have this 6,000 square foot house in the middle of the Sando de Cristo mountains in this incredible setting. And I got a gun in my mouth and, you know, like I, like I said, um, you know, it wasn't, that I wanted to die. I just wanted to get rid of this pain that I had lived with the, you know, the, the majority of my life. And, uh, can you, can you even describe the pain now? I mean, is it, is it still there? Obviously not to, to the extent. No, it's nowhere near that place, but I needed to go to that place. Mm -hmm. I needed to go to that place because, um, you know, when I, like I was a millisecond away from pulling the trigger because I had it in my mouth and it was rattling against my teeth. And I remember what it tasted like. And then right at the moment of truth, you know, divine intervention came in and the little voice in my head said, you've never quit anything in your life. Why are you quitting now? And that allowed me to take the gun and throw it into the desert and, you know, like I said, I had two choices. Was I going to die yeah. or was I going to live? Well, I chose to live, but guess what? I have no frigging clue how to live life on life's terms, right? And so um, that was the beginning of my healing journey, right? 
so that so that was the the turning point where you sort of made that that decision inside you that yeah. you weren't going to carry yeah. on with this you were going to yeah. try and try and heal yeah so how, how did you seek help because i think that isn't that's sort of the big the biggest thing i guess is, is realizing you need help and, yeah. and, and actually asking for help well I, i'd been to four treatment centers before that incident so i had i had some tools in my toolbox right uh you know i'd been to tons of AA meetings you know and and 12-step groups and all that so you know i had a good base mm. right i had a, i had a good base and but i you know, I, I never surrendered is what, what happened. Right. You know, I was always, you know, in between. That, that's an interesting word surrendering. And it comes up a lot when I'm doing meditations, you know, and I hear you, you've got to surrender, you've got to yeah. surrender. Um, so you, 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 do, you've done the 12 step. Mm -hmm. You still were there with the gun in your mouth. And it was this word surrender. Can you explain how that Well, no, it, it was like, it was like, uh, so I, I was, I was living with, uh, this girl and, uh, you know, for the first six months of the relationship, we partied together. Right. And then one night we have this horrible, massive blowout argument because we're both, you know, survivors of trauma. And so our anger is like, yeah. you know, always right. So I end up in the washroom on my hands and knees and I'm crying and I'm like, I'm done, like done, 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 done. And uh, so when I was in Santa Fe, I used to go to an all men's 12 step meeting every Wednesday. And uh, that, that's, is, is the all men's, is that important? Do you think for, I mean, I'm, I'm just interested. Is it, did it feel better to be, just no it, it was just it was just it was a it was a wednesday meeting and you know it was in this guy's backyard he had this beautiful backyard in santa fe you know the skies just go on forever so you know it was just like a cool yeah healing healing place so um so one night after a meeting i'm outside having a cigarette and uh there there was this guy I got to know and uh, he was an older gentleman, but like just one of the most handsome dudes I've ever seen in my life. You know, he was an old biker, old motorcycle rider. He had this beautiful white hair, you know, he was tanned and he still, still had muscles. And so I'm outside having a cigarette and he comes up to me and he says, uh, he says, Hey kid, how you doing? And I was like, you know, I'm, doing okay you know uh hanging on and, and then he said uh you know how are you doing with your higher power stuff and i looked at him i was like you know it's not happening right and then he said something to me i'll never forget he said uh <clears throat> do you realize in this program that you get to pick your own god and i was like like what the fuck are you talking about you know and, and so as I'm in the washroom that night, I remember this conversation that I had with Jack years before that. And so I'm in the washroom and I say, you know what, I'm going to give this God of my own understanding a try. And so I went up one side of God. I went down the other side of God. I called him every name in the book. I made up a bunch of my own. And then I said, um, you know, God, I, I realize you only give me as much as I can handle. I said, I am full. I said, you can't put one more thing on my plate. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, please, 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 God, take away the obsession to drink and do drugs. And so I went to bed. And the next morning I got up and uh, I was on my way to the, to the latrine and uh, in my house at that time, I had this big mirror that I had to walk past. And as I'm sort of rubbing the sleep out of my eyes, I glance and I look at myself in the mirror and I stop dead in my tracks. 
And here I am standing in front of this mirror, looking at myself for the first time. And I don't even know how long, right? Because I couldn't look at myself. I was so full of shame and all, all this stuff. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, like five minutes goes by, 10 minutes goes by, 30 minutes goes by. And then finally, I'm like, holy shit. And I started to feel different. And, uh, you know, about 40 minutes into this staring contest with myself, um, I was like, holy shit, my prayer has been answered. And that was September 18th of 2005. And I haven't had a drink or a drug since that since that moment right wow and, and had you been spiritual before uh, before this point you were in this were you from a spiritual family i mean well I, I grew up i grew up in the catholic church right i was an altar boy uh for many years and on thursday nights i would go to my mom's jehovah witness bible study so I had, <laughs> so, so when Jack said to me, you get to pick your own God, yeah. like it was like, what, you know, none of this shit makes sense to me. Right. You know? And, uh, and so, um, you know, that was the day I surrendered and I turned my will and my life over to the care of the universe as I understand it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, what I always tell people is, you know, left to my own defenses, left to me running my own life is the biggest shit show on the planet when I'm running the show, right? And, and so to, because I, I can't trust anything. Right after what I've experienced, well, you, I have, yeah, you you haven't had a life exactly right. of people, people yeah. anything giving you great, great yeah. confidence or trust. Yeah. So that day in the washroom, I I gave it all up, and I said, you know what, I can't do this anymore, and I need some external something to sort of take over, and uh, you know that was. Hang on, I got it on my phone. Because I don't talk about it in years. I talk about my sobriety in days. And I have this little app that okay. reminds me. That was 5,604 days ago. That app. Wow. And have you missed it since? Has there been no. a day day gone by where you've been tempted? Or, or you've had a, you, no. you had a down? Like, you, you must get down days, right? I mean, oh, yeah. You must yeah. get down days. Let's face yeah. it, we're going through a big down day at the moment. But, but here's what happens is, you know, my toolbox was filled with, my old toolbox was filled with alcohol, drugs, food, sex, gambling, you know, anything, any addictive uh, piece I would pick up, right, to suppress that emotional pain yeah. and suffering, right? And, you know, when I surrendered, it became different, right? I had to switch the toolbox. So what do you use now or well, well even back then? Um, let's take it back then. Mm -hmm. um, because presumably you just didn't sort of wake up and go, right, that's it. There must yeah. have been some, some other recovery things that you were doing. What, what, what do you now use or what did you use back then in your, your toolbox? Yeah. Well, being a very driven individual, very focused, very, uh, um, competitive person. I've done absolutely every single therapy known to mankind, right? Okay, which ones work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think they I think they all work if you have the right attitude, mm -hmm. right? You got to believe it, or it's not going to work, right? And. You know, I remember when I first sort of started in the therapy sort of world, like I wasn't ready for help. So nothing was working. Yeah, right? of course, of course. Um, but to me, uh, relationships really helped me. Like being in solid relationships where nobody was co-signing my bullshit. People were... 
People yeah. were calling me out on my bullshit, right? And I didn't like it, right? But I knew that those were the people that I needed to be around because I needed accountability in my life. I needed to be accountable to something. And, uh, you know, like I love therapy now. Like I'm addicted to therapy, you know, all kinds of therapy. And, uh, and so, you know, as I started doing more therapy, started to, uh, because let's face it, the one relationship in my life that I neglected the most was the one I had with myself. Okay. And, you know, cause I didn't like myself. Right. And I had to, I had, I guess that's, that's the bottom of it of so many people's, um, you know, why they don't move forward. It's, it's the relationship they have with themselves. And we, we don't get taught this in schools. No one teaches you, Hey, the first person you've got to love isn't your mom and your dad. And it isn't your intimate relationship with you, but it's just, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. And, you know, but there's stigma attached to that as well, because yeah. everybody says you're being selfish. Yeah. Exactly. Well, guess what? If I, if I don't love myself, then I can't be in a relationship and love the person that I'm with if I, if I don't love myself. Right. And so, you know, started to unpack all of the layers of, you know, trauma. And as I did that, I started to feel really good. And, you know, what was interesting is when I left the game of hockey, like I didn't have a plan B, C, D, E, F, G. I didn't have a plan. Right. You know, I made $50 million in my hockey career. Right. And had you invested that? Were you okay? Were you set up? For no, no, I, I blew it all. I lost it all. Okay. Lost it all. So, well, I wouldn't say I, I lost it all. I still had a little bit left. Right. And so, you know, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? You know, I'm third, what am I, 41 years old? And I still have more than half my life left to live. And I have no, no idea what that looks like. So um, I, uh, I was approached by, um, by a company uh, who wanted to write a book with me. Okay. And uh, I was like, you know, I was a little leery about, you know, writing an autobiography about all the, you know, the shit that happened in my life. And, and at this point, had you talked about the, the sexual, the rape? Or the nothing, like nothing. Okay, you so know, there, I would say there was five people in the whole entire world that actually knew my story. And uh, so... When I sat down to write the book, I was only going to talk about my hockey career. Okay. I wasn't going to talk about all the off ice shenanigans. And the lady that I chose to co-author this book with me early on in the process of writing this book, she made me feel safe. How did she do that? Just, just through her own demeanor. Mm. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I trusted her. And so as, as, because we would spend, you know, two to four hours in every session where she would just ask me questions and, and, you know, we, we would jump all over the place. Right. And so what she did is she put them all together in this timeline to make sense of my, of my story. And how did it feel you actually become like, because you presumably you're sort of reliving it as you're as you yeah. counting it. Mm -hmm. how, how did that make you feel? Oh, it was like a huge, you know, it was like taking the baby grand piano off my uh, off my back that I've been carrying around. And so, um, three and a half years later, we finished this book, and I tell the whole the whole story, front to back didn't leave anything out so four days before i was going to toronto to launch this book 
like and I was. No knows. Still, what we're just talking about. Nobody I knows. Still knows it. Okay. Nobody knows. All all the people know is Theo, fantastic ice hockey player, um, champion, gold medalist. This yeah. the other has left because of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And the made recovery. Yeah. Okay. So four days before I'm going to Toronto to launch this book, I am shitting in my pants, yeah. like scared and scared because I don't know how everybody else is going to react to what's in this book right had you and, ever seen your the abuser that the coach since oh yeah yeah I would I would see him during different times in because he was still around the game like he was still right and uh and so and I also knew that I was going to go do a whole bunch of media surrounding the book and I knew that the only thing the media would be interested in would be to re-victimize me at every opportunity they can get right so because I'm a very smart and bright guy I spent four days on my computer researching every single thing I could find on the subject of child sexual abuse because I wanted to get a story of hope and healing and recovery out to the masses yeah because you're not I mean, the victim, I mean, that, that word again, that's another word yeah. that, that is yeah. just kind of say, got Yeah, and I used to out. get severely triggered by that word, right? I used to get triggered all the time by that word. So anyways, I go to Toronto, and the first four days I'm there, I do 300 interviews, okay? Because, you know, when you win a Olympic gold medal in hockey in Canada, you're like a bishop. Yeah, yeah. Catholic, it's sort of like you know, Queen of England, I guess. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? So I was on every major TV show, magazine, radio show, you name it. And just like I predicted, the only thing they were interested in was the gory details of my sexual abuse. But like a good politician, and, you know, I'd spent the first 35 years of my life in the media, right? So I knew that I never had to answer the reporter's question, right? So I had my own agenda. So no matter what question they asked me, I had my agenda. And so I got this story out of hope and healing and recovery and all these positive messages and stats and, you know, brought to light the uh, enormity of sexual abuse, right? Did you not feel at that time, you know, and I, and I know it probably wouldn't be right for your recovery, but did, was there not a point of you feeling anger or vengeful for what this guy had done to you? No, no, I was, I was, uh, I was about to step into my purpose. Okay. Because you remember in the washroom, what did I do? Yeah. I surrendered, surrendered, turned my will and my life over to the care of the universe. So in some sort of way, I knew that the universe was never going to hurt me again. And that there was something bigger about to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had to trust, trust in the process of where, you know, I asked to go. Right. I asked to go somewhere else. Yeah. And right? I, we'll come back to that. Definitely. Yeah. And so, um, so the next thing on the itinerary was the first book signing. And, uh, you know, my expectations for this book were like really low. Like I didn't think anybody was going to read it. I thought I'd show up, sign 10 books, go to the next city, sign 10 books, so on and so forth. So I show up at the biggest Indigo chapter store, bookstore in all of Canada, downtown Toronto, three levels, you know, just massive place. So I walk through the front doors of the bookstore and there's 400 people standing in line with my book. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, what the fuck are all you guys doing here? You know, like, what is this all about? So I sit down at the book table and I start signing books. 
out of the corner of my eye, spot this guy in line. And he's got my book clutched against his chest and his face is buried in the floor and he's walking really slow. And, you know, he almost looks like he's homeless, but he's got my book. Okay. So I follow him all the way in the line. He gets to the front of the line. He puts the book on the table, looks me in the eye and says, me too. Wow. Wow. Okay. So in that moment, I knew exactly why I wrote the book. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.